Hi, welcome to a new series on the channel. This is uh, very exciting for me. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time. This is an introduction to advanced concepts, advanced material. This is going to be a lot like how you might handle doing some jobs with a client or maybe like an exit project for a design school. I wanna show you all what it looks like to go for something ambitious, something at the edge of your ability. You know, how to think high concept, how to push out and handle drawing challenges you haven't had to handle before. Many of you wanna be concept artists, right? Most of the instructional drawing content out there in our little niche is aimed at people who want to be concept artists, designers, illustrators, but most of it focuses on the techniques, which honestly are basically unchanged for roughly 500 years, and forgets how the hell to manage ideas. So I wanna to try to go through some of that in this series. And I do really think we need this. I mean, I love a lot of the same content out there that you guys see, but very little of it presents this part of the job that artists do all the time. Problem solving. Most videos on YouTube, for example, are edited to only show the successes for obvious reasons. They should do that. And most show people working within their comfort zone and not necessarily making swings at ideas that they know are maybe out of reach or very close to out of reach. Most importantly, very few showcase the internal narrative of problem solving, which is the essential operation of a designer, illustrator, anything, anyone who's solving a problem. This series is an attempt to showcase that. I'm going to narrate and try to put into words the push and pull that's going on in my head. Might it get boring? Yes. Is this super marketable? No. Do I care? I probably should, but I don't. That's because, well, at the risk of shooting myself in the foot, this content isn't for beginners and advanced content just needs to be communicated in this way. I think it's useful for beginners. I think it's important that beginners expose themselves to the actual process of art making and not just the process of studying to make art. But I won't lie and say beginners should expect to replicate this process or have a fun or easy time doing it. This process requires a facility and ease with drawing that only comes with time. So what is this project? Well, I'm not gonna front load it too much here because I can talk about most of it while I draw. So instead I'll keep it short. This is a collaboration that I'm getting together with Gio Nakpil, a great designer and 3D artist. We both love Dante's Divine Comedy, which you're probably familiar with. And we both love making art with demons and beasts and anguished bodies in general. So, well, the winds blew the right way and we're gonna try to make a VR diorama of a scene from the poem. We're looking at the fifth canto first, in which Dante and Virgil encounter King Minos, Paolo, and Francesca, and we'll discuss their characters as we get to them. I thought this project was too good to pass up as the subject to start this series. It's really perfect because it's in my wheelhouse, I know the material, and I draw this kind of stuff already, but the scale and the application are completely new for me, so we'll be able to move along quickly but I also know I will make many mistakes and go down errant roads because I've never designed for VR before, and I'll get to adjust and course correct for those mistakes. It's also really good because it's not just for me. Having a collaborator will produce moments where I have to make choices analogous to ones I'd make in client work, which obviously I can't record and show client work on YouTube. So with this, I won't just have to fake changing course on certain things for the sake of showing you guys, there's some actual stakes. I want this stuff to excite and work for Geo. And when he pushes back on stuff, we can address it just like client notes. Now, I think that's about all I need to say by way of introduction. So let's look at some of the references and research that I pulled when I started and then get into drawing. Let's take a look at my references. This is a bunch of stuff that I pulled in the beginning before starting to sketch Minos. 
Um, this is an app called PureRef, in case you're wondering, which I believe is pay what you want if you want to try it out. But at a glance, this gives you an idea of the kind of stuff I'll pull for a project like this. So it's a mix. It's all kinds of things. It's photos, it's paintings, it's uh, real world things, it's fictional things, it's uh, anything, anything that seems relevant. And you'll also see that there's stuff that is tangential thrown on here. I just want to use my references and especially a board like this as almost a catalog of where my mind wandered to while I was researching. And um, this isn't a very rigid form of research. I didn't like, I didn't like, for example, make a little list and say, Minos is a king of Crete, so let's go read the history of Crete and then find out what did chairs look like in Crete? What's the ecology like in Crete? Uh, how do people wear their hair in Crete? That can come. You can decide to go down that path. I didn't hear, I, I mean, I did read the Wikipedia page for uh, classical Crete and uh, like Minos's Wikipedia page and all that. But um, this kind of a board is more like a, I guess you might say it's more like a vision board. It's broader than that. Um, it's broad enough that it also includes pictures of things that I know I don't want to do. Some of these references are reminders of like, stay away from this instead of do this. So it, it, it's very broad. Let's just, uh, let's go into some of these and just, I'm going to click through these really fast and just tell you what I liked about a lot of them. What made me, what connection I made with them to the piece and why I thought they'd be helpful. So this is a painting by William Adolph Bougereau, Bougereau, I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, this is one of my favorites, the uh, flagellation of Christ. Flagellation? Flagellation? Anyway, I, uh, I own this painting. I uh, have it in my bathroom, the original. I actually have it in my shower so that I can stare at it while I shower every morning, but um, it's getting a little wet, but I, re I really love owning this one. It's one of uh, many of his paintings that I own in my luxurious chateau, but uh, it's always been a favorite. It more than any, this one winds up on a lot of my boards just because uh, I love it so much. And it's, this one's almost like just a benchmark, but for this piece, the specific thing that I like here was the, um, the lost ecstasy in Christ's face. For some reason I connected with that and, you know, we'll see later. Um, when we start drawing Francesca, that this is sort of a starting point for how I want Francesca to look. Let's uh, go to the next one. This one, hmm, if I go left, where does that go to? Whoa, okay. Um, another Bouguereau, bunch of nymphs flying. Um, this one's pretty direct reference. <laughs> These uh, ladies are too happy here, but this scene from the Kanto has uh, people swept away by the winds of passion, and uh, it's sort of a writhing body of, uh, you can kind of see it over here in this doré etching. There's a bunch of bodies flying through the air over here, and um, this is just sort of a, a great reference for that. You can see how similar this section is to something like that. And Doré, big inspiration for me. Um, this one's direct. This is Doré's illustration of the Kanto and scene that we're doing. So yeah, this is, a, this is pretty straightforward. And this kind of is a, a counterfactual example. This, one, this is one of those ones that I take to say, like, don't wind up just doing this. Like, add something to the conversation. Doré already did this great. What can we add? Um, this is a painting by Sam Bindelden Finchetsmu the third of Seldania. Uh, it's a great painting. I keep this one in my kitchen. Uh, I love it. Very direct. Also a Doré, I believe. Yeah. Another shot of this scene. Uh, yeah. Again, bodies flying. This is giving you an overall idea also of what's in this scene. We have Dante, we have Virgil, we have this huge mass 
of uh, bodies that have been swept away by these infernal winds. And we have Paolo and Francesca featured. And Minos is not in this, but he is in the same canto. And because we have more flexibility, because we're making a VR diorama, Minos is going to be in ours. Like, you know, Doré making a 2D, 2D picture here, he, didn't have, he doesn't have space to include so much in his, but uh, we have a little more flexibility. Who knows? Maybe in Doré's mind, Minos was a, like, if you turn the camera right around, Minos was right behind us. This is uh, one of Bouguereau's drawings for Christ in that painting. Just uh, very inspirational. And uh, yeah, had to censor the uh, maleness there because uh, Jesus is a famous sex symbol. And uh, gazing upon any depiction of his human anatomy uh, tends to drive people into fits of lust. And uh, that's not appropriate for YouTube, so... So that explains that block there. Um, I added this one to the board after I did a lot of the sketching for Minos. I did some poses that reminded me of something. And I, for a while, I was like, what was it? Well, what is that reminding me of? And then eventually it clicked. Um, the poses were reminding me of the pose of, I believe this is Moses, um, but this is a, a Michelangelo sculpture. And uh, yeah, I just threw that on there to make the connection in the similarities between what I was drawing and this thing that I've seen so many times. That's another one of my sensor bars, I assume. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. Uh, this is uh, Michelangelo's painting of Minos from The Last Judgment. And uh, can you guess what's going on under there? It's a little snake popping up. Yeah, I think you can, think you can put two and two together. <laughs> I think I talk about this a little bit while I'm sketching, but uh, this is a pretty classic depiction. It lines up a lot with Doré's, um, Michelangelo's typical massy representation. This is not a snake um, wrapping around Minos. This is actually Minos's tail. He wraps the tail around himself uh, to depict the level of hell that a soul he is judging will go to. So we might read this as two wraps, so whatever soul he's judging is going to go to the set, the second circle of hell. And I thought for years that those ears were supposed to be bat ears. Uh, and reading the wiki page for this, I apparently those are donkey ears, which are a sign for stupidity. Interesting. I don't know how we got back there. Hmm. My order got turned around. Sorry. Not sure who painted that. I pulled a lot of these off of... Um, if you want to know who painted a lot of these paintings specifically of uh, Francesca and Paolo. I pulled a lot of these just off of the art gallery that is on the wiki page for Francesca and Paolo. I didn't pull the names of the artists, unfortunately. So if you do want to know, you can find them there. Just uh, Google Wikipedia Francesca and Paolo and on their wiki page, they have a little collection of art that depicts them. This is Doré's depiction of King Minos right before uh, his depictions of Francesca and Paolo in the in his illustrations for Inferno. And uh, yeah, this is a good one. And this really shows how classic you can go with Minos. Um, he's just a typical Grecian or Roman idealized male figure. And he's got a crown because he's a king and he's got his tail. You know, you can go that simple to depict him. And I actually thought for a long time that that was just like with the Michelangelo one. I thought that was just a snake that was wrapping around him, but that is indeed his tail. Yep. Very similar. Actually, I believe this is a Doré painting based on his, uh, oh yeah, it says so down there. Yeah, this is a Doré painting that I think is based on, is it the same as? Yeah, it's like a, flipped version of his etching here. So that's good. We saw that. I like Dante fainting. Uh, Gio and I are not sure that Dante will be in the VR diorama. We might want to imply that you are him. So uh, we might not get to depict him fainting, but interesting. Love that one. 
it's one of the more unusual or a more modern feeling representations of uh, Paolo and Francesca in hell. A depiction of their death in their life. So not them in hell, but um, if I remember the story correctly, uh, Paolo is her brother-in-law. She's cheating on her husband with his brother. And uh, I believe her husband caught wind of this and caught them mid-coupling or something like that and uh, stabbed them. Uh, pretty violent, but um, I actually thought that this might be a good sort of mood for their pose even in hell. Like imagine if they were nude and they were just sort of floating and flipped upside down, but in this pose, it'd be kind of cool. And this sort of shows you what I was thinking with um, the connection between Francesca and the face of Christ in the flagellation of Christ. You can see how, or at least I, I hope you can see how for me, something like that feels very resonant with that. Whoa. They seem like similar expressions. Yeah, interesting. Um, yep, more classic depictions of Francesca and Paolo. A lot of this is not super useful to me. This whole top section up here is more to say, uh, look how it's been done before. Uh, they're pretty uniform except for a couple standouts, right? Like this one's probably one of the most graceful and uh, striking, but the poses are, you know, it's really not all that dissimilar until you get into something like that, like that one up top. Uh, that one's pretty cool too. I love the underlighting. Might swipe a lot of stuff from that. The, I think I want to get away from the straight up and down pose. A lot of them are very vertical. I think horizontal might be compelling like that. Uh, like that one up there has a more horizontal layout. Same. This is a big touchstone. This is William Blake's representation of this scene. And uh, I love William Blake. Um, this one is a good touchstone because it shows everything that we want to get in to this diorama. So we've got Minos, again, a very classical depiction, except now he's got a spear. I swipe that later on. We've got Dante and Virgil, at least I believe this is Dante and Virgil, because uh, they are, yeah, typically represented in blue and red robes, but then there's also this yellow robed figure, and I don't know who that is. Maybe that's a soul, the soul that Minos is immediately judging. Um, yeah, there's a question there, because very few figures get robes in Blake's illustrations except for Dante and Virgil. So I don't know what that yellow one is because uh, there's a clear difference between the nudes and the robed figures, right? But we've got Minos, we have souls that he's judging, we have Dante and Virgil, and we have the figures that are being tormented in the winds of fate. And uh, any one of these could be uh, Francesca and Paolo, but this is a good touchstone. It shows us everything that we want to get in here. And uh, I just love William Blake. Uh, He's, um, well, we could talk about him for a long time and much ink has been spilled over him. His next depiction for this scene. So this leaves Minos behind and just looks at the whirling tempest of anguished bodies that is in this part of the canto. And again, we see Dante in red there uh, laid down. He's passed out, which makes me think that these two figures above him are Paolo and Francesca. Don't know who that be, not sure, but a uh, great depiction. So 2D, very, I can't even try to put into words what I feel about Blake, but uh, he's a good reminder that you can do whatever you want. And as long as you connect with the material, you can make great work. This is so unusual, so unlike what many of us would do today. If you did a thumbnail for this, you'd probably throw it out. But to me, this is one of the best drawings ever made. I love this thing. Another Doré. Uh, this one is not a depiction of this scene. This is when they encounter the Minotaur later. But I just threw it in here for a good measure because uh, Minos is the you know creator of the Minotaur. How did you get 
the end. <sighs> All right. Yeah, more the same. But I really like Dante passed out here. That's a nice, uh, that's a nice passed out Dante. Unfortunately, um, not unfortunately, just we're unsure if we're going to put Dante in here. So we'll see if that's super useful. These are great. These are big touchstones. These are a sculpture for a memorial to Dante somewhere in, ugh, crap, I forgot. Um, I forget where it is. I want to say Vienna. Don't quote me on that. But uh, if you want to find this and see pictures of what's up top, you can search a memorial to Dante sculpture or bronze or statue and it'll pop right up. But uh, this really um, this really inspired me. This was a big inspiration. I loved the... Um, before I saw this, I was more thinking of a depiction like that or like blake's depiction where he seems rather ferocious and he's decreeing things when i saw this in my research i realized that i resonate more with this that he's contemplative that he's thinking that he is taking his job not ferociously but seriously you know uh this really stuck with me and the pose inspired me too but uh the pose is so similar to rodin's the thinker that i think uh um, maybe there's no, maybe the artist wasn't thinking of that at the time, but, um, I think being inspired by this pose also results in a, a lot of allusions to the thinker. Um, are you guys seeing how, uh, how to think through your references and, and, and find what about them is speaking to you and letting them begin a conversation in your mind about how and why you want to depict things in your piece the way that you're going to? Because there's an infinite variety of options and um, searching for references and getting into them and just really observing them and asking yourself what they make you feel is a great way to narrow the scope and uh, really figure out what you want. This is all part of design. This is the first step in the design process without any pencil touching the paper. This is, I'm sure you can tell from the way that I'm talking about this, a lot of the design thinking, a lot of the design problem solving is already beginning to occur um, without any drawing work being done, right? We're in a, we're in like an art director mode right now. This is the top section of that sculpture we were just looking at. And uh, I'm not sure who that is, but that's Dante and Virgil. Just thrown in here for good measure. More from that, love those punished people. Probably specific punished people, it might be. Um, actually, I don't remember who carries stones, so I won't speak out of turn about that. Um, this is a Roman marble of apparently King Minos. Um, he, this is like one of the few depictions that pops up when you Google him. And uh, I don't know what, what's going on up here with this uh, burst. Maybe that's some stylized crown, or maybe it's a stylistic element that's supposed to imply how wise he is. But um, good for the face. And um, I was doing a lot of thinking about how to handle his beard. I wanted it to um, be in line with the classic Greek and Roman sculptural depictions of facial hair, because I think that's like a trigger for us to think that someone is a, of a classical descent. It, I think it it's an immediate allusion to the classical tradition. So this whole section gets kind of interesting. Um, these are all photos of old bodybuilders that I really liked. Um, you'll see, well, you don't see it so much in the sketches. I don't get into it too much, but it's on my mind a lot that I might want Minos to, I don't want him to just feel like a freshly built, uh, perfect Grecian hero. That's a very uh, average body. There's not a lot of design there. It's gonna, if you just go with that, it feels like it, it can wind up being the the stock uh, male body preset that like comes with your 3D software. So I just had a thought that maybe he, he, he is a mythological Greek figure, but maybe 
after all this time in hell and you know having aged, I, I'm not sure if Minos died young according to mythology, but there might be something to be thought of there. That his body has sort of um, it's aged in this very particular way. He had a very strong body. His body is still very strong, but he has still grown older and has started to sag and change uh, interestingly. I love this kind of stuff. Dad bod stuff, you know? Arnold Schwarzenegger is a, probably a, one of the best examples because, uh, yeah, I mean, this is what it looks like when the most extreme, like classical ideal uh, sort of relaxes and droops a little. It keeps this broad thickness. Like, look how broad his pecs are. Look how deep they feel. They seem so tall to me and just so wide and those wide delts, but everything has softened. I like that. Um, everything is just dropping a little bit. I love this interesting, like the bulgy abs up here. It's not a, I don't know how you describe this. This is like such a unique formation of form right here. It's like, that's not a beer belly. That's not a beer gut. That's like a, what else could that be but an I used to be ripped and let it go stomach, you know? It's so specific to me. So very inspirational. I just, I get very obsessed with uh, subtle distinctions of anatomy and form like that. I just, there's so much work to be done to make something like that specific, you know? And then the counterpoint to that, and I actually encounter this while doing my sketching, is going more in the direction of like a yogi body. I wind up turning away from this path based on design decisions that you'll see in the actual drawing process. But uh, these are just references when I was considering going with a more yogic, more... When I think wise, just me, the way I'm conditioned, when I think of wisdom, I think of this more than I think of like a wise Grecian or Western king. So that's how that stuff wound up in here. More reference for the beards. Um, no, this is an idea that I actually forgot about that maybe I should reconsider. But um, more Roman sculpture, an idea for how they uh, depicted themselves to trigger that classical pedigree. But I believe I was trying, I was thinking of breaking off his nose to indicate some decay and like a very light allusion to we're in hell and things have gone wrong, but also to get a more serpentine appearance to echo the themes of his tail because um, the tail does feel a little tacked on in, uh, in the depictions of him that are just basically a normal human body with a lizard's tail. So maybe I should reconsider that. Very inspirational, just love that. These were sketches that I did that this was in the middle stage um, when I made the yogi turn. I just threw these on here to keep me on track. Love this guy's body. Uh, yeah, these are on here mostly for his upper body. Um, this was maybe thinking a little ahead to tortured souls, but um, even for Minos, if he gets aged, I just, uh, God, look at those pecs. They're just great. Yeah, and look at the the striations on his um, chest. Uh, yeah, do check out that website if you're in the market for a very good um, high res reference. Oops, you know what? Let me uh, back onto my sensor. My God. Uh, yeah, I just really needed to put those there because um, any nude body that we see is an invitation to be uncontrollably lost with lust. And I want you guys to focus on art. It's my responsibility as a censor to uh, decide what's going to titillate you and uh, to especially prohibit any possible titillation in any sort of public artistic venue that uh, is completely, completely inappropriate. And um, it's very important to ruin um, art with uh, censoring so that uh, the ignorant and stupid masses can uh, focus on the high level messaging instead of just uh, standing in front of every nude painting and uh, just making out uncontrollably with each other. And uh, another great dad bod. No sensors needed there. Another great dad bod. That's good stuff. 
more yogis. Love how soft this is. Love his chest too. Love the, uh, love, uh, love that crease right where his pecs are. But then that bulgy, you know, that who knows what that is. That could be a weird shape to his upper ab, could be a weird shape to his, um, to, uh, the lower part of his pectoral, you know, it has a little tail that comes out underneath here. It could be, it, it could be that. Um, but I just love the softness, the soft, like you can kind of see here, this is like a soft round form on his chest. Then there's like a little crease or maybe a darkening from hair. And then there's still that soft bulge underneath. Just uh, love interesting, unusual configurations of form. Um, it's just so much more interesting than doing the same stuff we always see. You'll see in the sketches that I consider, um, I pretty early on know that I want him on a throne or a seat of some sort, which is, that's not unusual. A, a lot of depictions of Minos are in there, but um, are on a throne. But at some point I consider sitting him in Lotus. Again, once the yogi idea is come, coming in, I veer away from that later, but these are just some sculptures of a uh, Shiva that, I put there for reference. And I actually got really excited about these because Shiva, uh, actually just by coincidence, th this has a lot of mirrors to the symbols that we're working with. He uh, he has snakes wrapped around him, which are a, uh, well, there's a ton of ways to interpret that symbolically, but uh, they definitely are commonly associated with Shiva. And he's also a, Shiva's also a Lord of death, a God of death to some capacity. So the connection there between Minos judging the dead in hell is strong. I got pretty giddy about that connection when I found it. Love uh, love finding connections between East and West on all of this stuff, all of this stuff. Yeah, Shiva, Shiva, drawings I already looked at. Ah, this is uh, Ugolino and His Sons by Carpo. I uh, actually own this one as well. I have this in the receiving rotunda of my Italian villa. It really catches the Tuscan sun just just beautifully. And uh, it's a powerful statement to the people that I want to intimidate when they visit me. And uh, I think um, many of my art deals have really hinged on the fear that this sculpture strikes into the hearts of collectors I'm trying to buy from at low cost. But uh, one of my favorites, uh, I love having this one. I. Uh, slap every ass on it whenever I walk by it. But um, pretty obvious connections here to the stuff that I'm drawing, just classical uh, forms and bodies. And again, we're getting great anguish here. It's great reference for anguish going forward. And um, Minos here, uh, not Minos, uh, Ugolino here has a, you know, his, his expression is complex. He's going through something very complex. He actually appears later in the Kanto, not in the Kanto. He appears later in Dante's Inferno. Um, actually, is he in, in Inferno? I believe he is in the Inferno, right? He's not in Purgatory, <laughs> whatever. Well, he's in the story later, but um, even now he's great reference for a pensive look, a very thoughtful look. It's too extreme on him. You know, he's thinking of cannibalizing his children. So he's maybe, uh, he's having a different expression than what's going on here, but um, you can see the connection between those two. Yeah, okay. we know what that is. All right. It seems my reference order got uh, broken up. Let's, uh, let's see if I missed anything. I think that's a good overall look at what I swiped for reference just right here to begin with, Minos. And um, if the reference board, I'm gonna add a lot to this as I get into the other characters, but it's not so important what I add. I think it, it's more important that you just get this overall look and see that I'm not looking for specific reference of the poses in my drawings, right? These are all generalizations. These are all touchstones. These are all benchmarks. These are reminding me what I do want to go for and what I don't want to go for. Um, none of this stuff, except maybe uh, these on a few of the poses that I draw, none of this stuff is serving to inform like a pose directly in any particular drawing. I'm always drawing from imagination and trying to make my own choices. 
Um, and that will continue as I add more to this board. If it changes a lot, I'll do another little reference check-in just so that you guys are getting both sides of the story. All right, let's get into drawing. Here we are drawing Minos, a little bit sped up, a little bit, a lot of bit. First reaction here, kind of came out like an old man, sort of an uh, Minos. Not exactly the tone that I wind up going with. He's uh, He comes out a bit hunched over, a bit uh, witchy in this one, and uh, I didn't like that. I was leaning a little bit too much towards a twisted spooky guy in hell. I don't think that's what I want for Minos. He's in hell, but I don't know about twisted and spooky. I think, uh, I think for Judge of the Dead on this one, instead of going twisted and spooky, it's a little better to go Wise King. I think it works thematically for Dante's Inferno better that way. Because a big theological theme for Dante's Inferno is uh, the justice of the whole situation, what it means for God's judgment to be just. Now, Minos being an extension of that, he plays an important role in uh, getting people to their proper eternal punishment. I kind of want him to reflect that. So this guy still feels, you know, he doesn't seem ferocious. He kind of comes off still a little bit sinister or spooky in this sketch. And I think instead it's better to push Minos towards sober and serious. Like he takes his job very seriously because it was given to him by God. Kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. But yeah, you can see with like those drooping fingers there and the hunched over position. And he was even more, he had like a real hunchback before that kind of got covered up with uh, his tail. But right now he's more, uh, more witchy, more gross. Not exactly the right tone. And that's not a snake wrapped around him. Like we discussed when we were looking at the references, that's uh, his tail wrapping around him. And I did all the tails as reptilian tails, like snake tails or lizard tails or something like that. But I don't think the Kanto actually specifies. I think I really could have explored any kind of tail. You know, who knows? He could have had a big elephant tail or something like that wrapping around him. I think the poem itself actually just only says that it's his tail. It doesn't say what kind of tail. But the classical depictions and just the first thing that I pictured in my head was the traditional reptilian tail. Drawing a very important lizard down there. He's been condemned. All oh, he's on fire. Bad day for him. Some fire back there. Very important. Arrow to highlight how absolutely vital it is to draw that cartoon fire in there. Another sketch here that doesn't go anywhere. I think I rubbed this one out later. Just trying out different approaches. I was drawing with a high opacity. This one's starting a little lower opacity, but I don't wind up doing anything interesting with that. So instead I go to this silhouette blob sketch. I think it's good when you're doing this kind of sketchbook time where you don't really know what the hell you're gonna do and you're just searching around. I think it's a very good idea to sketch with all sorts of different tools and materials and tools that put things down in different ways because your tool actually does limit your thinking a lot of the time, I think. For example, if you're holding a really hard, sharp 4-H pencil, that tool is not going to incline you to produce ideas that are big shapes of flat graphic value because it would be a nightmare to fill them in with that pencil. But those ideas would become very accessible and quite desirable if you were working with a big piece of charcoal or sort of like what I'm doing now, a big texture brush in Photoshop. So jump around, don't get stuck on one. Digital is really nice because any brush can be used big or small, right? So even just using the hard round in Photoshop, you can do linear ideas, you can do value ideas, you can mix it all together without switching tools. And when I sketch traditionally on paper, I do wind up covering my desk with all sorts of different tools to overcome that limitation of one tool. 
if I'm in exploratory sketchbook time. Another sketch over here, kind of one for a more haughty look on this one for Minos. His uh, head is looking up, but his eyes are looking down at us. I think this gets across the idea of sober, wise judgment a little better. He sort of has an expression like he just had a eureka moment, you know, like he just he just realized where he was going to put you after you admitted your darkest sin. You said something, you whispered something to him so that the other souls couldn't hear it. He immediately went into this expression like, ah, I know exactly what you deserve for the rest of time. Again, my inclination is to go sinister with stuff like that, but I think the character of Minos would uh, not be nearly so mean about it. He's just. He'd probably hit at something like, um, ah, well, quite a dire sin indeed. Poor wretched soul. I believe I know exactly the punishment for you. In ancient Greek, of course, That's what he would have spoken, right? Ancient Greek, King of Crete, who knows? People smarter than I know. So I wrote up there old yogi in the top left. That's because the way that I sketched his body, sort of the robust but thinner body with the ripped long limbs, it kind of reminded me of sort of the traditional look of the old yoga guru or the aged yoga guru. And I react to that here. I've known in the back of my head that I'm probably gonna put him on a throne of some sort to enhance that feeling of royal judgment, divine judgment. I wanna push that. So I've known I'm gonna put him on a throne, but I just did this sketch real quick, reacting to the yogi look that I struck upon, where I consider having him sit cross-legged on some sort of pedestal or something like that. And that's got like a little bit of like a lotus throne kind of a look, like a lot of classic Eastern sculpture of Buddha. And I like that. I like crossing those things up. But that is not the direction that I go. And it gets, it gets too mixed up. I actually, for myself, really like the, um, the yogi look for Minos. But I think anyone, even people who know the story, would be hard pressed to identify that that character is Minos if he looks like that. So you saw there for a split second some pencil drawings that I did in my sketchbook of the yogi idea since I liked it for myself. There you go, they're back. So you can see that I did grab onto it a little bit, but what those sketches really taught me is that, yeah, I don't think someone is going to be able to call out that this is Minos unless they're very acutely connected with the detail that he wraps his tail around himself. Barring that, I think even someone quite familiar with Dante's Inferno would, uh, it's not checking the right boxes to make you think it's him. It doesn't feel Grecian at all. It feels very, yeah, Eastern, very classic Eastern wise man. Now, if I was doing this for myself, I might still go with that because, well, I get to decide my own standards, but working with a collaborator, I didn't want to go that far off the rails. And it wasn't that big of a payoff for going that far off the rails. So this new drawing, I'm starting a little bit slower, not doing as much general laying in just going piece to piece on Minos's face, looking for the expression that I want. I closed his eyes because I want, uh, I want his third eye pendant that's hanging from his diadem to imply that he's contemplating, looking inward, using his wisdom. You can see when I throw that indication of his hair that I vary the, the amplitudes on the hair. I show it there. The curves are longer near the top of the hair and they get shorter and more aggressive near the bottom. 
That's because the hair near the top of his head has is supporting, it's carrying weight from more hair underneath it, so it can't curl as much. The ones at the bottom have nothing to support, so they can curl more aggressively. If you just make the same curve over and over again for wavy hair like that, it doesn't look designed, it doesn't look good. I stole that from Muka. He does that all the time on his hair. Getting that beard nice and Grecian or Roman. The Roman portrait buffs always have a lot of nice, really curly locks in the hair. I doubt their beards actually look like that, but sure looks good in the sculpture. Getting him wider, trying to make him a little, little bit more robust, get away from the yogi look. See, I keep erasing and thickening the limbs. I want him to follow more the classic Western Grecian hero body. Just a little bit thicker, more packed on with muscle. You actually don't make people feel powerful by just drawing a bunch of definition in the muscles. You can be super skinny and weak and be ripped as fuck. It's actually the thickness, the horizontal widths in the proportions that make someone look packed with muscle. That's what you want to pay attention to. So I'm sort of referencing that too monstrous sketch that I did over there on the right. I didn't like that when it got too inhuman. It, it just looked like a straight up demon, like someone who'd always been in hell instead of someone who had once been a human. But uh, I liked the pointing idea from this one. So I put this little design drawing in a similar-ish pose. The pointing to imply that uh, whatever, whatever doleful shade is before him is being told what level to travel down to. And then I get a little wrapped up here drawing like a, I don't know what, the, it's not a toga. It's like a, there's all these technical words for how they wrap their robes around them. The Greeks, what is it? A, a hymation, a chitin. I forget the words, a shiton, something like that. But I get wrapped up here. And then I remember that he needs his tail and everything. And that he probably doesn't have clothes in hell. But an interesting exploration nonetheless, because uh, it is a design consideration where it is a design consideration to wonder, would he have clothes? Is there some reason that he would? Those are pretty broad questions. You know, some of the depictions we saw in the references, like Paolo and Francesca have robes or some sort of drapery that they're flying around with, which uh, is probably just a <clears throat> symbol of the prudishness of the times. but. Um, doesn't really make sense in hell. I mean, if they're being punished, why are they allowed to keep this one flimsy piece of fabric by the powers that be? I think they'd probably just be completely nude. So yeah, I realize that at this point and just dupe it over and draw the body nude. Keeping it very simple, I'm not putting any... Uh, not putting a lot of information in the body. I add some, but uh, I don't want to get into the weeds of drawing like nice anatomy because since I'm going to wrap the snake tail around him, if I wind up doing some nice piece of anatomy, it's going to demand a lot more thoughtfulness from me to just go over it if that's where the tail needs to go. I'm going to subconsciously want to avoid going over the thing that I drew well. So I'm just skipping that problem and putting nothing there on his body and just thinking about where I would want the coils of his tail. So yeah, I'm going for these high energy loop-de-loopy -loopy things, loopy-loopy shapes up there around his head. I strike upon the idea of having it sort of snake around the diadem to bring focus to it. But then it doesn't really pop off the silhouette that nice, so I erase this version and have it come off in a bigger sweep right after it wraps around the diadem. You can see I'm trying to avoid the classic coils 
I was thinking of how it might animate when I was drawing that over to the right there. So I'm not having it just cut straight across his body, except for in that middle area. Having it sort of come out and over and then plunge down, shoot up, just to get a little, something a little different there with how it wraps around the body. And I'm trying to keep the number of wraps to a minimum. In this case, three. I decided not to do those wraps up and down the arm because uh, I feel like it asks a lot from the mind to then, I think it hides the idea that it's his tail. It makes it much less likely that it would be his tail rather than a snake wrapped around him. Because then your mind starts wondering, well, if it went up his arm and then got back up to the top of his head, you know, how many times did it, did it have to double back down his arm? So I think it's better if it just stays close to the torso and doesn't wrap so many times. Now that I know where the tail's gonna go, I'm putting some anatomy in. Nothing special here. This is like a, a modified A pose for a modeler. You know, if you're a, if that arm that's on our right were uh, mirrored over to the left side, it would be a, basically a perfect A pose for someone to model over, but have it modified just so I can put his staff in his hand. I don't want to commit to something like an orthographic view when I don't really have my design locked down yet. And I was just getting in the weeds here, seeing if I could, if I really liked this design by drawing on a little more, seeing if anything exciting occurred to me. Nothing. I just wind up stopping it right around here. But I'm looking for a little bit of value breakup, I can see. I'm like darkening the ends of the arms and the legs, but yeah, it doesn't wind up doing much for me. I multiplied that snake several times so that it became opaque. That way I could really assess if I kind of like the, the thicknesses there. You know, if you look at something like an anaconda, they're uh, almost a consistent thickness through their main belly. And then when it gets to their tail, it like drops off very suddenly. It, it's not like a, a smooth taper down to the tail. The tail, the tip of its tail happens very suddenly. You'll see what I mean if you Google an anaconda. Here's a sketch of that design, but now on a throne. So now that I've taken a look and thought through some things about the design, just standing, started to put it in a pose. And I wound up liking this pose fine. Um, the one that I draw after this winds up becoming the one that I gravitate to the most just because it's it makes a little more sense than this one. I like the casual position of his legs in this one, but it kind of also looks like he's about to get up with how his his left leg is sort of poised. Oh, no, I said that I like the one that I did after this one best, and that is not the case. I forgot that I did this drawing. This one came out a little too sinister. This one came out looking more like it's just the devil. It looks too, uh, with the dark shadows under the eyes and the sort of insincere, sarcastic head on the back of the hand pose. It just came off kind of Machiavellian, you know? I don't think it was right for Minos. Yeah, I think if you just showed that pose with the reptilian tail that looks like a snake wrapped around the body, you told someone, this is an inhabitant of hell, who is it? I think most people would say it's Satan, like the Lucifer. So I think this one, not right for Minos. but could be useful to use somewhere else. The sketch to the, the first sketch, the one to the left, where he's sort of holding his beard, that's much more sincere, much more lost in thought, I think. I think that communicates better that he's 
taking his job seriously and thinking, thinking it through, making judgments. The one on the right looks too evil. Looks like he's only pretending to think. Like he already knows how he's going to fuck you up. For a different demon. So having had that reaction while drawing that, I go back and take another look, another iteration of the, of the first pose. I actually wind up liking this one best. It doesn't look like he's going to get up in this one, but his legs are still positioned in a little bit more of like a casual, not going anywhere kind of a pose. I like this one. Instead of pulling on his beard, I'm drawing it more like just his, uh, his hand is covering his mouth. I'm really getting the benefit of minimizing the number of coils in these seating positions. It's much simpler to, to imagine how the coils would wrap around when he sits when there's only three of them to deal with. So you can see I'm lining them up there and comparing them. It's almost a mix of the two. This part of the designing feels a lot more like acting. I'm having very little internal monologue that has anything to do with drawing. Almost none. All of my internal monologue for this design task is more, is this right for the character? Would he do this? Would he act like that? But if this is really his situation, why would he be like this? That's, those are really acting considerations. That's really what this part of the job feels like. I'm putting him on an actual like throne throne in these sketches, like a kind of referencing what what real Grecian chairs look like, but that's not what it's actually going to be in the diorama, I don't think. I think uh, his throne will be more like what's going on in the top right, sort of carved out of stone or or just an iconic uncarved boulder you know, that maybe has the vague shapes of something like a throne. We'll see. That kind of requires its own design pass. And here I was really only thinking about Minos. Besides my incredible drawing of the lizard on fire, I've uh, had very little consideration of the environment surrounding him. But we will have to get to all of that if we want this to be really good. There's a bird outside my window looking at me. I see you, bird. Don't get comfortable. So I'm just circling that like a crazy person because I'm saying, yeah, I like that one. And uh, I'm going to let the next part play out in real time because uh, I lose my mind. I want, I want, what do I want? God Damn it, what do I want? Let's stop chasing that white whale. Fast, you can see this is consciously faster than I had been drawing before. just to be less analytical. You can get yourself into shit ton of trouble doing this though because um you can arrive at a design that um only works f 
from the wacky shapes that come from being fast. And then to press that forward, you kind of always need to like draw fast to keep that energy. And then that makes it really hard to resolve the design later. It can be done, but you need to have a lot of patience to uh, reconstruct the shapes at every step because you will lose them as you clean things up. You will lose them. Heed my warning, young apprentice. Use wild shapes and you will lose them in the cleanup. Just giving him a crown because he's a king, right? <laughs> He's in a pool of blood. No, I'll give him flags. I'm such a hack and I love it. I love to be hack drawn really fast, really, really fast. His legs too skinny, big meaty thighs. Just indicating them. Ugh, gross snowman shapes. Okay. Muse. Gods of art, give me the answer that I need. Shut up, motorcycle! I'm sick of you! Sorry, my blood runs hot. I get all pumped when I do an exercise like this. It's easy to just uh, lose it a little bit. Because you're pushing it, you know? You're really you're trying, to, trying to get juiced up. Man, wow, the anxiety is building. Come on, baby, come on, just a little faster. Just a little faster. Don't think about it, Steven. Just do the drawing. Um, okay, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All right, give him a. Oh, oh, he gets it with the kitty cat in his eye. Meow, 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 meow. All right, back to drawing. Big, big shape under his. Oh, this file is gigantic. Big file, uh, big shape under his. Think I'm a jobber here. Get that. What's his beard? What's not? Ooh, that kind of ruined it. Forget that. Why am I fucking with value? Why am I undoing? Okay, let's just get that back up there. I'll give him a big beefy chest. Ooh, that's much too beefy. We don't like that. Ooh, that's very dad bod, but too thick. Much too thickly. We need a. A little bit more of this kind of crystal thick. <laughs> See a big old muscle right there. Yeah. Uh -huh. Maybe a little dull guy like that. I like the, uh, I like the, um, it, it's shown up in other sketches, but the idea of that big Grecian beard just like blowing in the hellish wind of that infernal plain. Seat of desolation, void of light, save that which those glimmering flames cast pale and dreadful. You know, that place. Just like that down there. You know, big shapes, whatever. Let's give him his hymation or his chitin or whatever the heck it's called. Blowing in the wind. Hi, um, I like to draw and my characters are just special effects. Uh, they're not actually characters. Uh, they are solely the wind that blows their drapery around and that's just how I design things and screw you if you don't like it. Do -do 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 -do. Throwing everybody under the bus when I'm doing these wild uh, fast as I can go sketches. Screw that one. All right, just Okay, now, ah, ooh, hmm, hmm, oh, ah, yeah, hell yeah, that's nothing. We gotta try something else. Over here, ah, oh, I'm gonna make him look the way I feel right now. I swear to God, it's a good idea to do this, to just speed up your hands sometimes and draw way faster than you're used to. It is conversely a good idea to slow down your hand and draw 
way fat, way slower than you're used to. You should try them all on occasion and then let them balance out on their own. And then when you're really doing it, when you're really just trying to make the best drawing you can, then don't, don't force anything. Just uh, go at a delicious pace that you enjoy. What if I just get his chest and warp mold? Make it really, oh, that'd be odd. I could do that and then warp that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Warping drawings quick and sloppy and without much in mind is a good way to find, uh, find angles of lines that you would normally never draw. Nipples, nipples on that meat bag, nipples on those pecs, and they're looking gross. Yeah, they're looking gross. And I'm giving him stupid, not designed Frank Frazetta, just waist robe thing. Let's give him a real, another indication of a real Greek thing. Don't judge me for calling Frank Frazetta's design stupid. He's one of my favorite artists of all time. I give him enough love and ecstatic appreciation that I can shit on him sometimes. Back up, all right? Back up. Boom, fire. Yeah, this mood does not work for me for him, man. I mean, this is cool and all. <sighs> all right. This stopped being useful somewhere around there. Somewhere around there, it stopped being useful. I mean, stuff like this is Cool. I mean, it's not like I don't like this. I I like comic booky stuff as much as anyone else. You know, just really push proportions, right? Like a tiny chest, you can do big arms and all that. It's just, it feels really, even here where he's got sort of a smoldering look, I feel like it's a little trying to go for this, like explosive, like God of War energy or something like that. And I love that. That's great. And that's going to be appropriate in other spots. But I'm still not sold that it's right for Minos. All right. Uh, that burnt me out a little bit, so I'm going to go play fetch with my dog and think about this. And uh, you should do that too. Don't forget to take breaks. Here's most of the work that I've done so far at a glance. It's not all of it, but it is most of it. I uh, didn't copy paste like the stuff from my sketchbook into here, but it's usually good It's usually good at points in projects like this to lay out everything that you've done and take a look at it all together. Because when I was drawing like this, for example, I thought I was exaggerating so much. And I thought that this was so different from uh, that and from this. I thought, you know, when you're drawing it at scale and, you know, you're in the middle of doing the decision making. Um, stuff feels more different than it actually is. And when looking at it at a glance, I see that really I've zeroed in on a pretty regular human proportion. Um, and for all of my trying to break out of the box, every time that I did so, like in this cursory little baddy silhouette, or in this more monstrous kind of a thing. And even that's just very human. And this just displeased me so much. Really my reaction to those, my reaction to trying those things out was that I abandoned them pretty quickly. You know, I, I didn't really take those drawings very far and I was reacting much stronger to um, a more regular human approach. So once I realized that looking at this at a glance, I thought that it was time to do something that you only get to do if you have a collaborator or a client, which was uh, send it off and you know bounce it off of someone. So I picked a few of these and I sent them to Geo. I picked, which ones was it? I sent him like a representative crossing. I sent him that one. I sent him these two, I believe. I sent him this. 
Um, I sent him others, I think. Did I send him this? Well, I sent him stuff that um, I felt was representative and I bounced it off of him and I said, um, you know, what do you want to do? Do you want to, do you see this and do you want to react? Do you react like you want to go more monstrous? Uh, do you want it to be more twisted? Are you more okay with the human angle? Um, I wanted to see what Geo would close the door to, hopefully, because that just helps focus the thinking and narrow the field a little bit. And uh, it went really well. You know, the drawings got him excited and uh, more important than any reaction to the to the drawings themselves was that we had a conversation and, you know, this was the first time that we were really seeing how our thinking aligned on a lot of this. And uh, it aligned pretty well. Um, Geo also uh, feels that the more human approach is the way to go, that there's, there's not really a need to um, hit it over the head with the grotesque hell thing. You know, Minos was a human person. It makes sense that he has remained very human. And he really agreed with the approach that um, Minos doesn't need to represent his power through his physique. Uh, I think that's almost exactly the words that Gio used. But um, like we were saying when we were sketching it, that he really has nothing to prove. He has room to, uh, his position is not in question. So he has room to not do like any of this like insecure posturing, you know? He really has room to just, um, yeah, not be so ferocious and, uh, you know, in a way just like needing to exude his power. He has the security to just take his job seriously. And uh, Gio liked this stuff. He, he was even okay enough with the very human approach that he said we could just give him, he could basically be completely normal human and we could just give him a super compelling face. So I think that now that we've narrowed the field and we have some great touchstones from our collaborator, um, we can end this part, or we can end this video, we can end part one of our sketching Minos here, because this was um, seeing how things were gonna turn out with a very broad, um, with a very broad brush, just not really having a lot of limitations. And now that we have zeroed in on what we like, and it turned out that it's also what our collaborator uh, likes, um, there's now, you know, we don't really have to go back and do a revision step. We can move into being more specific and uh, not necessarily cleaning this up, but we're just, uh, we're going to refine this idea. So I think we can do that as a part two because it's really a, it's a next step. So this was fun. This worked out well. Um, we've got a clear direction on this guy going forward. So yes, in our next video, let's either keep working on Minos. I'll probably start with figuring out that face, like Gio said, really trying to find something compelling and being very specific about the emotion that he's conveying and uh, also the forms, right? Because we want Gio to have a lot of information when he models. And if we don't do that, we'll jump over to, in the conversation I had with Gio, we also developed a lot of touchstones for how we want to handle the scene in general. So it might be useful now that we have a, a character that we can project into the scene that we we know the fact that Minos is human and also a resident of hell, almost a demon, and looks like this, gives us a foundation to evaluate other choices off of for the scene. So now that we have this, it might also behoove us to, before we get into his face or anything like that, go and look at the scene in general and look at some of the choices we might make about the souls that he's condemning, about the bodies caught up in the whirlwind of passions, about Paolo and Francesca. We, we now have something to compare them to that we're pretty confident this is the direction we're gonna go with. For example, the bodies that are um, being windswept 
uh, in their punishment in this part of hell, uh, we now have a reference point saying that people can remain quite human in hell um, given the right position and stature. So that gives us a point of reference to maybe make the people who have been being windswept for thousands of years much more grotesque. We really have a reason to want to push them that could make sense with the story, and we can set them off even within the Tempest with figures that have arrived recently that are less distorted. They're much more human, and we know that we're okay going with a much more human depiction because we've established with Minos that not everything is totally psychedelic and wild just because it's in hell. So we've really got a lot of stuff to work with for our design thinking. So let's look at that in the next video, either Minos specifically uh, on a second pass, or let's look at the scene in general. And uh, I hope you guys had fun with this. Uh, this has been a blast for me. I'm so excited to be covering more uh, nitty gritty design stuff with these videos. Um, I love teaching this kind of content. So I hope you guys had fun. If you made it all the way through this video, I know this is gonna wind up very long. Um, I hope it was worth your time. I hope you had fun. Uh, thank you for sticking with it. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, you know, leave them down there. I'll uh, answer anything that I can. And I'll especially try to get to the stuff that's really pertinent pointed questions. I do my best not to leave people hanging on specific questions, but um, anything you have to say, I greatly appreciate it. All right, and we'll see you guys next time. I lied. I wanted to have something in color for the thumbnail for this video. So I did a little painting of Minos, of the design that we did in this uh, video at least. And uh, yeah, I just recorded it for the sake of completion so that you guys could see it. So here's how I painted the thumbnail image. And not a lot of design work going on here at all. You know, this is pure illustrating because we already know the design from all the work that we did in this damn video. Did it. So now you just paint it as if it were that easy, as if it were that damn easy. Not a lot to say here. Just painting knowledge, drawing mileage content for other videos, truly. But uh, some interesting things here. I have my references up there. You can see them running around in Pure Ref. I like using sculptures as reference for color paintings because uh, value is way more important than color. So sculptures emphasize the values. So you can use that to plan your structure and your value pattern and make up the colors on your own, which is really not so hard. And also the sculptor has already emphasized the forms for you. They've exaggerated them and stylized them. So it makes it easier for you to find aesthetics and to, it just gives you something really good to react to. And uh, you can see that the bust I'm using right now is one by Rodine. So uh, what's better than that? Was he the devil? Uh, how the hell did he do that stuff? And that's it. <laughs>